Hello, this is Dr. Ross, and this is um, going to be a guided tour through the cardiac anatomy for use in anatomy and physiology 2 at Lee College. So this presentation is going to cover um, topics from external anatomy, cardiac vessels, internal anatomy, and the conduction system, um, and should be a tool you use for preparing for the lab practical. So let's start with the external heart anatomy. So the heart, of course, is a muscular organ that pumps blood around the body by circulating it through the circulatory or vascular system. It's shaped and sized roughly like a closed fist with two-thirds of the mass of the heart to the left of the body midline. All right, so we're going to start by talking about the atria and the ventricles. These are a little easier to identify in sectional anatomy, but you can also identify them from the external. Um, you can also identify them on the, uh, by external features on the heart as well. So recall that the atria receive blood either from the body or the lungs. Um, these chambers are highly expandable, so when they are not filled with blood, uh, the outer portion deflates and kind of looks like a lumpy flap. This is called an oracle. There's an oracle on the, <clears throat> on the right atrium and uh, there's an oracle on the left atrium, and they are shown uh, in this image that I've just highlighted. So we can also identify the right ventricle and the left ventricle. So these are located, uh, if you're looking at the outside of the heart, they're located here. Um, <clears throat> and then we also have uh, the inferior tip of the heart, which is called the apex, excuse me. Okay, this, all, um, this image also shows large veins and arteries that deliver blood to and from the heart. Um, to the lungs. So the deoxygenated blood will leave the heart through the pulmonary trunk. <clears throat> the trunk will split into the left and right pulmonary arteries, which deliver blood to the left and right lungs. These arteries branch into the superior, um, <clears throat> into the superior and inferior um, pulmonary arteries on either side, but uh, that's not really depicted well in this particular image. Now, after leaving the lungs, the now oxygenated blood is going to return to the heart uh, through the left and right pulmonary veins. And there is an inferior and superior left and right pulmonary vein, uh, and these are actually shown in this image, and they've been indicated here by my little boxes. So the heart also receives and delivers blood uh, to and from the body. Deoxygenated blood um, arrives from the body through the vena cava. Um, so the portion below the heart is the inferior vena cava, and the portion above is the superior vena cava. Once um, the blood is oxygenated in the lungs and returns to the heart, it's going to leave the heart once more through the aorta. The aorta can be further divided into the ascending aorta, um, <clears throat> the aortic arch, and the descending aorta, uh, which you can see down here at the bottom. From the aortic arch, the blood will move into the brachiocephalic trunk. Uh, this is the first branch off the aortic arch, and it's going to ultimately supply blood to the right arm and the head and neck. Next, from the aortic arch, you're going to have the left common carotid artery. This is the second branch arising from the arch, and it delivers blood to the left side of the head. There's also a right common carotid artery, um, but it branches off from that brachiocephalic trunk um, to deliver blood to the right side. Then we have the left subclavian artery. Uh, this is the third branch from the aortic, aortic arch, and it supplies most of the blood to the left arm. There's also um, a right subclavian artery, but it originates also from that brachiocephalic trunk. Okay. So like all other tissues in the body, the heart muscle needs oxygen-rich blood to function. So we have coronary arteries that supply blood to the heart muscle, as well as coronary veins that drain blood. The coronary arteries, arteries wrap around the outside of the heart and branch off into smaller arteries. The two main coronary arteries are the left and right coronary arteries. Um, 
The left coronary artery supplies blood to the left side of the heart muscle. Um, the left main coronary is going to divide into two into branches. We have the in anterior interventricular artery and the um, circumflex artery. The anterior interventricular artery, which is uh, highlighted right now, uh, is also called the left anterior descending artery or LAD artery. It supplies blood to the front and the left side of the heart, and it's located within the anterior interventricular sulcus. The sulcus is just a groove um, that aligns with where the left and right ventricles are separated. So you can use this to identify the left and right ventricle from the external anatomy of the heart. This uh, artery is sometimes referred to as the widowmaker. Um, due to the risk of death occurring when this artery is blocked. It's actually a high risk of death um, that will occur. You have a high risk of death when you have this uh, artery blocked. Uh, so next is the circumflex artery. This also branches off from that left coronary artery. It's going to encircle the heart muscle. This artery supplies blood to the outer side of the back of the heart. It's located in the coronary sulcus, again, another groove, and this one separates the atria from the ventricles. Of course, that separation's on the inside, uh, but this groove matches up with where that separation occurs. So the right coronary artery is the major source of blood to the right ventricle and atrium of the heart. Um, and it's also located along that coronary sulcus. It will branch into uh, the right marginal artery, among other things, and this artery supplies blood to the surface of the underside of the heart. So <clears throat> the great cardiac vein um, is the first one I'm going to talk about here. So this is the companion to the anterior interventricular um, uh, artery. So the great cardiac vein um, drains the anterior aspect of the heart um, and um, it runs along that anterior interventricular sulcus. Um, this, um, this small cardiac vein, also known as the right coronary vein, drains the external layer of the right atrium and the right ventricle of the heart, the external area. Despite its size, it's one of the major drainage vessels for the heart. Um, this uh, small ligament up here is called the ligamentum arteriosum, uh, and it's a small fibrous remnant of the fetal ductus arteriosum. So what is that? The, fe the ductus arteriosum is a normal blood vessel that's present prior to birth, and it connects, as you can see um, from the remnant here, it connects the aorta and the pulmonary artery and basically um, bypasses the fetus's lungs because the fetus is gonna get oxygen directly from the mother's placenta in utero. All right, so in this slide, we're gonna change our view to the posterior side of the heart. You can still make out the aorta um, and the vena cava, as well as the pulmonary veins and arteries. So aside from these veins and arteries, the next largest structure in this image is the coronary sinus, which is a large vessel that collects blood from the heart muscle via the other cardiac veins that basically um, drain the external surface of the heart and then deliver this less oxygen oxygenated blood to the coronary sinus, which then delivers the blood to the right atrium. Um, and it's located um, along that coronary sulcus. The middle cardiac vein, also known as the posterior interventricular vein, is a vessel located on the posterior aspect of the heart. It arises at that cardiac apex and it extends by draining, I'm sorry, it ends by draining into the right atrium, ultimately via the coronary sinus. And it runs uh, within the posterior interventricular sulcus along with that interventricular artery. <clears throat> the posterior interventricular artery supplies, um, supplies blood um, to the interventricular septum, which is the wall that separates the ventricles. Um, this is also known as the posterior descending artery or PDA.
Okay, so now let's turn our attention to the internal anatomy of the heart. So we'll start with the right, right atrium. The right atrium collects blood from the uh, vena cava through the uh, superior vena cava opening um, it, and the inferior vena cava opening. It also receives blood from the heart itself through the coronary sinus, through that coronary sinus opening. Now, contraction of the right atrium ejects blood into the right ventricle, and then the right ventricle is ultimately going to eject blood into the pulmonary trunk. The left atrium collects blood from the pulmonary veins, um, and then contraction of the left atrium ejects blood into the left ventricle, which ultimately is going to um, eject blood into the aorta. Additional features associated with the chambers include uh, the fossa ovalis. Um, this is a depression in the right atrium of the heart at the interatrial septum. Okay, so the septum between the atria, the part that divides the atria, is, you know, that's the wall of it as seen through that right atrium. Um, basically, this is a remnant of a, uh, in a thin fiber sheet that covered the foramen ovale, which is present in the fetus. And what it does is it allows blood to enter the left atrium from the right atrium. And it's one of those two fetal cardiac shunts, the other being the ductus arteriosus that we just discussed. Um, and, and that allows the blood um, <clears throat> that, to, um, that still escapes the right ventricle to bypass the pulmonary circulation. Um, so this typically closes at birth. Uh, in about 25% of adults, the foramen, uh, foramen ovale does not close completely. Uh, in most of these individuals, it causes no problems and will remain undetected throughout life. Uh, also found in the atria are the pectinate muscles. Uh, these are muscular columns that are present on the inner wall of the right and left atria, and it's thought that they increase the power of contraction without increasing the heart mass substantially. Now, the ventricles are sep separated by the uh, septum as well, called the interventricular septum. Um, the ventricles uh, contain what's called the trabeculae carniae, which are um, irregular, rounded, muscular columns that project from the inner surface of the ventricles. Um, these are different from the pectinate muscles. Um, they maintain cardiac performance, and um, they may be important in electrical conduction. Uh, next is the conus arteriosus. This is a conical pouch that's formed in the upper left angle of the right ventricle. Um, and this is for where the um, this is where the pulmonary trunk arises. And in some places, it is referred to as an infundibulum. So if you're having using a different text, you may see that. All right. So now I want to turn my attention to the valves, which we haven't discussed yet. The valves are one way, and when functioning properly, they're going to prevent the black the backflow of blood. So the tricuspid valve usually has uh, three leaflets. It prevents backflow or regurgitation of blood from the right ventricle into the right atrium during right ventricle contraction. Each leaflet is connected via chordae tendineae um, to the papillary muscles um, of the right ventricle. And we'll see this similar um, design in the uh, bicuspid valve. So let me talk about these two features before I move on to that valve. The chordae tendineae are just thin, strong, fibrous cords. They extend from the edge of the cusps of the um, tricuspid and mitral valves, the AV valves, to the papillary muscle. Uh, and this is going to be in the left and right ventricles. Basically what these do is they prevent the valves from prolapsing into the atria when high pressure is generated in the ventricles. Um, so I mentioned these are attached to the papillary muscles, and the papillary muscles are just thick um, bands and ridges of muscles that project into the lumen of the cardiac ventricles. All right, okay, so let's move on to the mitral valve. The mitral valve, or bicuspid valve, or left atrioventricular valve, has two leaflets, um, and they're going to be connected also to that chordae tendineae and to papillary muscle of the left ventricle. 
um, it lies between the left atrium and the left ventricle, um, uh, and uh, it is going to uh, close during ventricle contraction. Closure of this valve actually forms the first heart sound, the lub of the love dub or love dub, depending on which book you're reading. Um, the closing of the, the second, the, the closing of the tricuspid valve is what makes the second heart sound. All right, so the pulmonary valve uh, is a semilunar valve of the heart that lies between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. It has three cusps. It opens when the right ventricle contracts, um, when the pressure in the right ventricle rises above the pressure in the pulmonary artery. Finally, the, pul the pressure in that right ventricle is going to fall uh, rapidly, and that will, um, that will cause the closing of the pulmonary valve. The aortic valve is also a semilunar valve. It lies between the left ventricle and the aorta. When the pressure in the left ventricle rises due to contraction, it's going to open, allowing blood to exit the left ventricle into the aorta. When pressure in the left ventricle rapidly drops, it's going to close. The bottom of this image just shows the valves from above. Uh, the green are the um, atrioventricular valves, and the yellow are the semilunar valves. So now we're just going to briefly discuss the layers of the heart. So first let's start with the endocardium. This is the innermost layer of tissue. It lines the chambers of the heart and it provides protection to the valves and the heart chambers. You can see this in both the upper image and the lower image. The myocardium is the cardiac muscle and this is going to perform, this is going to make up the bulk of the heart. Uh, and it is composed of individual heart muscle cells. Last is the epicardium, um, which is also the visceral pericardium, which is the internal layer of that membrane. So this is the epicardium is the outer layer of the heart. It covers the heart from all sides except where the great vessels join the heart. Um, like I mentioned, it also um, makes up the pericardium. In this case, it will be the visceral layer of the pericardium. Remember, the pericardium is a serous membrane that surrounds the heart. Um, this layer is composed of mesothelial cells and fat and connective tissue. All right, the last thing we're going to discuss in this presentation is the cardiac conduction system. This is a collection of nodes and specialized conduction cells that initiate and coordinate contraction of the heart muscle. Okay, This rapid conduction of cardiac action potentials is going to allow the coordinated atrial and ventricular contractions that ultimately allow coordination of blood flow through the heart. So the cardiac conduction system consists of the SA or sinoatrial node. This is a collection of specialized cells called pacemaker cells. It's located in the upper wall of the right atrium. These pacemaker cells can spontaneously generate electrical impulses. The AV or atrioventricular node is located within the atrioventricular septum. Uh, near the opening of the coronary sinus. The AV node is going to act to delay the impulse from the SA node by about 120 milliseconds. It's doing this to ensure that the atria has enough time to fully eject blood into the ventricles before ventricular systole. Okay. Otherwise, you're not going to have all the blood uh, pumped thoroughly. Uh, the atrioventricular bundle or bundle of His is a continuation of the specialized tissue of the AV node and it serves to transmit the electrical impulse from the AV node to the Purkinje fibers of the ventricles and I'll discuss these in a second. So the AV bundle descends down the membranous part of the intraventricular septum uh, before dividing into the two bundle branches. You've got the right bundle branch, which conducts the impulses uh, to the Purkinje fibers of the right ventricle. And then you have the left bundle branch that conducts the impulse to the Purkinje fibers of the left ventricle. So finally, these Purkinje fibers. These are a network of specialized cells. 
Uh, they're abundant with glycogen, which they use for energy, and they have extensive gap junctions. These cells are located in the ventricular walls, and they're able to rapidly transmit that cardiac action potential from the atrioventricular bundle to the myocardium of the ventricles, ultimately causing contraction of those ventricles. This is the last slide for this presentation. Uh, you should be able to do your anatomy labeling of the, of the heart at this time. Thank you.